Awesome. Morning, guys. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to, to be talking to you guys today. So just a little bit about me. So as Mike said, so I'm from Woo. So I'm the head of the product team. So what that basically means is I'm kind of the middleman between the business guy, the customer, and then the engineering team. So trying to make everybody talk the same language. And actually, it's kind of a nice little segue in from the business day because I can kind of talk business, but then also talk tech, I suppose. So yeah, just sit back, relax, and grab a coffee, and we'll ease into the day. So, so what I'm going to be here to talk about today is, like I said, the, the, the very cheesy title, which admittedly was chosen on a whim, is to five million and beyond. So what that basically is, is we build a product called WooCommerce, which is the fastest growing e-commerce platform today. So we're powering, I uh, believe it's, I stand heavily corrected on the exact percentage, but it's approximately 20% of all e-commerce websites, which is quite something for a, a system that's only been around since about 2011. But anyway, let's dive in and we'll see sort of how that happened. So just a quick recap, like I mentioned earlier, so we started in 2011, so September, I believe. Yeah, September 2011 was our launch. And funnily enough, WooCommerce was actually spoken about maybe a year or two before that even. So it's kind of been a long time in the making. And yeah, it's a little bit of a journey from, from there. So we started in 2011, you know, this is very cheesy, but one engineer, one designer, and one desire, really. And the desire essentially is, you know, better e-commerce based on WordPress. So at the time, you know, you had a variety of e-commerce platforms for WordPress, but they'd been around for a long time. And, you know, most people like myself, I started building e-commerce sites using Magento and then trying to plug WordPress in as like a blog or a CMS or, you know, somehow tie the two together. And anyone who works with Magento and WordPress knows that they're very different systems. So basically WordPress with e-commerce, e-commerce with WordPress, sorry, wasn't where it needed to be. And that was the core desire that really drove WooCommerce to be what it is. And like I say, one engineer, one designer. So we scaled up in 2011, 2012, 2013, etc. We ended up with three guys. I said they're three full-time engineers. And these three guys took WooCommerce to 5 million. Right? When I say three engineers, what I basically mean there is three guys who, as part of their official job description, you know, we, we were a small team at the time, so everyone wore many different hats. But basically, these were the only three people who said, you work on WooCommerce as part of their actual job description. And most of these guys actually worked on about three or four projects at the same time. So full time is very uh, not exactly accurate, put it that way. So let's fast forward a little bit to 2014. And we hit 5 million downloads in November. So we're at about 6.5 million at the moment, but I'll get back to that later. So 5 million with three guys actually working on the product. Now bear in mind, this is a product that involves people's money, not just in the fact that they're buying it from you, because, well, this is free, but they're actually leveraged. So if you're off by a penny with someone who's running their own store, that has greater implications. There's a lot of pressure here. So having three guys maintaining a system for five million downloads is, is quite, a, quite a, it's no small feat, put it that way. So how, we have to scale, right? So we've scaled up for about 53 people now, and that's across the entire business. Everyone works towards the core of WooCommerce in some way, you know, whether it's support or, you know, providing customer feedback, writing a tutorial, whatever that might be, or, you know, like what I do with talking to partners and, and signing deals and things like that, you know, there's still only three or four guys actually working on the core product. So we're in 2015, and this is so March today, so this is where we stand at the moment, four full-time engineers. So there you see, well, I call them at the time, that was the four Wooskateers. But basically, that's three engineers and a product manager. It says they're full full-time engineers, but they're not all in the picture. So you've got a guy there in, from Holland, Barry, on the left, and then Claudio next to him, who's in Brazil, and Mike in the UK, and then Patrick in the US in Denver. So these four guys work every day on WooCommerce but there's still 6.5 million downloads powering 20% of all e-commerce websites. It's still quite a, an imbalance, if you know what I'm saying. So you know, rather than having a huge team of 1,000 engineers working on this product, there's only four or five people. So this is where we stand today, at about 6.5 million downloads, you know, racking up new downloads every day. Those who were here yesterday would have heard Mark talk about uh, the new installs um, metric that's coming on WordPress.org at the moment. 
So we can only now see it's, it's several million new installs as well. It's not just about the downloads. You know, every time somebody downloads the product, whether it's an update or a new download, it's, it's still a download. It's one metric. But now being able to see new downloads means we can actually look at a real tangible metric and say, well, it's still in the millions. You know, and we're looking at 11, 000, just over 11,000 commits on GitHub as well. And just a, a, this is just sort of a, just a, in terms of this, this is just about how the community contributes back to the project as well. It's not just us, but more on that in a bit. So stepping away from the actual tech side of things just for a moment, how do we actually do this? So a couple of the key takeaways that we found with, with a product like this, which is actually such an interesting product to scale. It's not just one market. And that's something that occurred to us not too early on, but maybe a year or two in, is we're not just playing in the WordPress market anymore, we're playing in the e-commerce market as well. You know, so we need to fully understand the different needs of the markets that we're in and how they tie together. So you know, it's, it's not just about saying, oh, well, this is something for WordPress. This is something like, how do you compare this to Shopify? How do you compare this to Magento, PrestaShop, et cetera, et cetera? You know, where does WooCommerce actually sit in the grand scheme of, of e-commerce? And then on that, so you know, hiring a developer is easy, right? You find a guy who's really talented and you hire him. But it's not just about hiring someone who can do WordPress or do WordPress. You know, everyone, everyone says, oh, I can do WordPress. But do you really understand WordPress? Do you, are you passionate about the community? Do you understand e-commerce? You know, if, if you speak to the average developer and you say, well, tell me a little bit about table rate shipping. You know, they'll, they'll look at you funny for a minute. You can kind of see like the hamster wheels just turning frantically trying to work out how to explain it. And then they'll come up with a clever explanation that's probably incorrect. Right? Whereas if you talk to someone who's in e-commerce, you say, tell me about table rate shipping. They'll say to you, how many zones do you have? What kind of rules engine do you want to use? You know, do you, do you require multiple shipping carriers for different zones? And they'll ask you technical questions, not about WordPress or PHP, but about e-commerce. So that was one of the, the very fortunate things. We've, we've been really lucky. <laughs> let's, just, let's just pause for a minute and just say we've been really lucky. I mean, the, the devs that we've hired and that we've worked with, you know, a lot of it's just kind of fallen by into our laps, which has been really a huge godsend for us. And one of the things is understanding all the markets you play in. It's back to the previous slide there. You know, so it's for the developer to understand they're working on something bigger than just the code. It's not just ones and zeros. It's somebody's store. It's somebody's life. You know, somebody's business. And that was just a really key takeaway for us in, in terms of scale in particular. Just having somebody fully understand what they're building just makes a huge difference because then they really are considering all the different aspects of what they're doing. And speaking of scale, so here's a couple of learnings that we've, like I said, we've, you know, we've had a lot of luck and we've had a lot of really key moments here, but there's a, definitely a few learnings. And as with everything one does, you know, you make a few mistakes and you, you, you have a few takeaways. So one of the key takeaways for us is be aware of scale at all times. Just to recap where we're at, so we've got four guys working on a product that's being used by millions of people around the world, right? And we don't charge for that product. That's a free offer. The code is open all the time. Everyone can see every commit you make, every mistake. You know, if we if we make a mess or we put a line of text in that seems bureaucratic or seems weird, somebody will call us on it, right? So scale is very important. And I've written there, so one method, one purpose, right? That's a sort of a programming mantra. You know, when you build one, when you build a class, you know, each method does one thing and does it really well. You know, you don't build methods that go on for days. And that's something that is really important to take to across the entire product. It's not just about the code. I mean, it might shock people, but it's not just about the code. Okay. Um, it's about scaling the entire thing. How does this work at scale? Right? How does, how does this work with 10,000 products? How does it work with 100,000 products? And just at this moment, I was just thinking, just while Mike was introducing me now, I was thinking about a slide that I actually left off here. So it's kind of, we'll call it exclusive content for ScaleConf 2015 only. But one of the key ways of doing this is eating your own dog food. Right? So we run WooCommerce on our own store. We're one of the biggest WooCommerce shops out there, as far as I know. And we process, I mean, that's just in terms of order count. I mean, Gerard's here today with me as well. 
who runs our entire store, keeps it online, keeps it going, makes sure people can actually check out. And we process purely in terms of order volume. It's, it's huge. You know, and this was one of the key learnings for us. You know, eat your own dog food helped us to identify areas where we need to scale correctly and where we weren't doing it. So that meant things like separating our data into, into dedicated tables, speeding up the actual queries we were doing, you know, indexing columns and tables and things like that, just really understanding what was going on. Like you can only scale certain things by doing it. You know, you can't just say, well, this will work. You know, you can't just, you know, thumb suck it and say, yes, this works, I'm happy. Even though you haven't tested it with 100,000 products, it works. You know, it's a very, uh, we've all done it, but it's difficult to, to do that reliably, I think. Unit tests for everything. Okay, so this is easily the biggest learning for us. Going back to scale as well, you know, this is this is huge, and this is something we're really trying to actively, well, let's say retroactively go back and say, well, do we have a unit test for this? Uh, because we, we didn't start with unit tests. We started with code, and we were eager just to push the code. And with one designer and one engineer, who's got time? You know, nobody's really got the time to write a unit test. And, some, and that sounds really, you know, I'll probably eat my words for saying that because now we don't, we try to make no excuses. You know, if you write a method, you write the test for it as well. And, you know, as we've grown, the importance of unit tests has been huge for us. Just being able to say to people, we are confident this works because of not just this number of downloads, but because we tested the code, it works. And then just a few of the tools we've picked up along the way. So, like I said, WooCommerce didn't start with tools like this. We literally, we said GitHub, push the code, go. That was it. You know, we didn't, we didn't sort of focus on the what ifs and let's test. And it was very maverick, but it worked at the time. And we can backtrack, fortunately, and we can go for it. So a couple of tools here. So Scrutinizer is a CI, so continuous integration. And it's really, really, really thorough. So yes, it gives you a few false positives, but it really makes a huge difference in terms of structuring of the code. It gives you a grading per class as well. So you can say, well, this is a B grade class or an A grade class. And you know, for a developer who's really proud of their code, looking at a class that they spent three weeks on says, oh, well, this is an E grade. You know, that's, that's not, not ideal. You know, and it happened. Like, I don't have the screenshot to prove it because he fixed it really quickly, but it happened. And just before I go on to the other two, so what's important to note with these tools is a lot of the tools out there are free for open source products. So Scrutinizer is completely free for open source repositories. So if you have a project that is obviously like running on GitHub or something like that, go for it. You know, it's there, it's quick, it's easy, it takes two minutes to set it up. You know, I'm not the most technical person in the office, but I set it up. And you know, it makes a huge difference. So really just be, bear in mind, like yet another reason to go for open source, definitely. Not just that people can see your code and actually contribute, which we'll get to later, but that you've got so many tools out there that you can actually leverage that are completely free. And then speaking back to unit tests for a minute. So coveralls, I don't know if anyone knows of coveralls, but basically it's a unit test coverage measurement tool. So you can say, well, based on the unit tests we have, compared to the code we have in the project, how much of the project is actually covered by the unit tests that you write? And you know, you write your first unit test, right? And you think, okay, now I'm covered. I'm done. I can move on. But then you load up coveralls and it says, oh, 10% of your project is covered by unit tests. And then you go, okay, um, maybe I should write a second unit test. And then it says, okay, 20% is covered. But not realistically, it's more like 12%. But it shows you really what's going on and how much of your project is actually secure for scaling. So a really important tool, once again, free for open source projects as well. And then TransFX is also free, but not for private projects, I think. So we've got a few private projects that we use it for as well. But this is a language management translation tool. So when we get to the point where we're at now with you know, six and a half million downloads and people around the entire world using the product. So it's not just English speaking countries, it's, you know, Russia, it's everywhere, you know, Asia, you name it. This is really important because people want to use the tools in the language that they're comfortable in. And this is something we don't often consider, but it's an aspect of the project that contributes hugely to scale and growth. So if, if you use WordPress, you can use WordPress in almost any language nowadays. 
So what we've done with WooCommerce is found a way to detect the language you're in and then automatically download the language translation for WooCommerce as well. So your entire WordPress installation is in Spanish or whatever language you're using. The issue is you need to have the languages available. So this is where community comes in as well. I mean, just from the conversations I've had with people, they really do want to translate their projects into their own, into their own language. So it's really important to do that. Also, definitely important to get somebody to check it because in, for example, in WordPress itself, somebody took, I think it was a really basic line, like something very trivial like um, about WordPress or something that's sort of in the footer somewhere and they translated it into happy birthday in another language and nobody checked it. So WordPress core said happy birthday in Serbian or whatever it was for like six months and nobody knew anything. So very important to get that stuff checked. Almost like getting a, a personal unit test for your language basically. So there's, yeah, there's several other tools as well that are around there. So I mean, obviously Travis and CircleCI and all these other options. These are just three that we use. And these are the three that we really focus on. So another thing we've done with, just before I move on to the next thing here, is with Scrutinizer and with all these tools, you can feed this information back into any communication channel you have. So we use a Slack at work. And obviously we have channels for deployments and things like that. And you can feed all your Scrutinizer information back into there. And what's really interesting is how that plays on the developer's mindset, right? So every time you push code and it says, oh, you've created an issue in Scrutinizer and then it pings you in Slack, then you think, oh, geez, you know, did I, re did I really code that? You know, and it kind of makes you a better coder. You know, we've got a guy who's really good with the front end stuff, but he's okay with PHP, but he doesn't sort of always test things. Like he doesn't go, oh, is this variable set before I use it, you know, or does, is this an array before I treat it like an array? He doesn't do things like that all the time because he just wants to get the project done. And then Scrutinizer says, no, you need to test this. And he goes, ah, oh, I did it again, didn't I? You know, so it's kind of a nice mindset shift that slowly happens over time. So very important to feed that information back into whatever systems you're using. So just quickly, so we've spoken a little bit about tech and we've spoken a little bit about the markets, but what about the people that actually use the product? You know, how do you... How do you scale your product like that? I mean, nobody, you know that, that whole saying of if you build it, they will come. That's not true. I'm just saying, it's not true. Like, you need to find the people who actually want your product. And I like to call this the cookie monster, right? So this is a, a term that is often bandied about in sort of lean startup circles and things like that. And anyone who knows the cookie monster knows that you just cannot get enough. It's not that there's a like of cookies. You know, he says like, I, I kind of like cookies loves, it's not even love, it's just an absolutely irresistible need to have a cookie. Like you cannot exist without it, right? And that's the customer you need to find, right? So how you do that is another story for another conference. But basically, that is the key to scale, right? Because if nobody uses the product, nobody will give you feedback. And nobody will say, oh, well, I need you to do this. Or there's a bug in the software that gives everything off by a penny. Or that gives free shipping to people, you know? but nobody will tell you if they're not using it. So it's really important to identify these people early on in the process. You know, we've got a couple of guys, you know, maybe count on one hand who we can talk to to give us feedback and we know that that's the feedback that we're gonna use because those are the people that really leverage the product every day and they say, oh, there's a bug here or we need this to scale differently because it's not working correctly or I have 100,000 products and I'm processing 20 orders every 20 seconds and it's not scaling what's wrong, you know, or things like that. So really important just to keep these guys in mind as well and just search for them. They're there. They're always there. And if they're not there, you're not building the right product, but they're always there. So, you know, have the faith. And what it really, how do you, how do you find those people? And this is how you do it, right? So this seems very like meta and weird, but helping people to help people, right, is, is how you do it. And that's just a very abstract way of saying it. So for us, what that means is in the context of WooCommerce, we are an online store who helps people make online stores, right? And those people can then also generate online stores to help other people make online stores and you know, recursively just goes and goes and goes and goes. And that's the kind of business model that works, right? So it's almost a business to business kind of approach rather than a business to consumer approach. You know, so you're saying, I'm a business who's helping you to build a business or helping you to succeed, 
whatever that might mean to that person. You know, you're just, just helping that person to, to really do what they want to do. I'll just take a little break here for a second. Yeah, so it's helping people to help people. And this is one of the key things that helped us to scale, is that we're building a product that we can actually say, we use this to help you to use this, to help the next guy to use this. So this could be us selling to an agency who then sells to a client. The client doesn't really care whether it's WooCommerce or Magento, they just want to make their money from their store or they want to get their you know, kitty collars or whatever it is, you know, doggy jerseys and who, who, they don't really care. They just want to get it out there. You know, so we can sell to the people who do care about it and then they can go and sell to the actual people who run the shops. So it's kind of a rolling, a rolling thing. And there's still all these questions though. So we've, we've spoken about scale and writing awesome code and unit tests and helping people to help other people and how very meta that is and everything like that. But you still get left with all these questions. You know, The business will come back and they say, we love Stripe. We want to use Stripe as a payment gateway. Or you know, developers love Stripe. So the agency will come and say, we want Stripe. We've sold our client on Stripe. We want it now. Do you have it? Right. We don't have time to build it. Or they'll say, we have 100,000 doggy jerseys sitting in a warehouse. Can you help us with fulfillment? And you know, we can say yes, or we can say no, or we can say maybe. But we're not experts in fulfillment, nor are we experts in Bitcoin or PayPal or Stripe or any of that. So how do we actually scale this? Because the questions keep coming. That's the one thing. People will always ask you for something that you don't always have. But how do you do that? So we want to help people to help other people. So we put in place key partnerships, right? This is one of the huge elements that helped us to shift WooCommerce into a new paradigm. So scaling WooCommerce, the product, in terms of the code and how does it actually run with the data and all of that, that's not too difficult. There's tools and genius people out there who can help with that. But how do you shift your product into a new market? into a new paradigm. And it's the partnerships that make the difference here. Like I said, their teamwork really does make the dream work. You know, that's internal and teamwork within other businesses and things like that. So we formed several key partnerships. So this is just several of many, many partnerships we formed across all the different verticals that we run with. So, you know, PayPal, Amazon, PayFast, sorry, and Canada Post, FedEx, United Postal Service, you know, these are our businesses that half of them we don't use. You know, we don't use USPS because we're not in the United States, but the customers do. So we need to understand USPS. We need to understand who the mutual customer is and how we build that, how we actually scale together. You know, other, other services like TradeGecko. TradeGecko is an inventory management system. So they're not, they're not the biggest inventory management system in the world, but they corner a particular market, the Australasian sort of market. And... They're really big in that market, so we need to help the customers in that space to do what they need to do. Obviously, Zero, the accounting software, everybody knows Zero. That's really awesome stuff. And if you're not, if you're in this room and you don't know what Zapier is, please go to Zapier.com. Like it's the most awesome service ever. Basically, it automates. I don't want to say the Internet of Things because that's not, you know, Willem saying he doesn't like that term, so I'm not going to say that. But it automates everything online, so you can hook up all your web apps and you can sort of do what you need to do. So you can say, every time I get an email from this person, put it into a spreadsheet or just fire off another action, like make a card in Trello. And then you can have another zap that says, when I make a card in Trello, put something in FreshBooks or whatever it might be. You know, so we also integrate with Zapier as well. So you can say, when I get a WooCommerce order, put that into a spreadsheet. And then you can have a, a calculation in the spreadsheet that works out, you know, profit loss, all that kind of thing. You can basically do whatever you need to do there to get the job done. So back on, on that point, so this is another area, speaking of, of integrations and webhooks, one of the key aspects of scaling in the background, so the stuff that the customers don't always see, is developing for the ecosystem itself. So WooCommerce is not just us, it's everyone out there who could potentially run or build an online store. So how do we open up that information to actually share it with other people, right? So APIs, webhooks, all these kinds of interfaces to actually build systems aside from WooCommerce. You know, you can have an inventory management system that works across WooCommerce, Magento, Shopify, 
all of these systems. But if they build that out and it doesn't work for WooCommerce, then we're at a loss as well. Then our customers can't benefit from that system. So we've just recently finished up our full API. So 2.3 of WooCommerce has push, pull, put, delete, and update on the API end, plus a webhooks architecture and interface. So you can actually load in, you can build a system that runs entirely on webhooks, and WooCommerce will work with it perfectly. So that's something we've really tried to do. This, this kind of grows, if you picture like a, a sort of a radius bubble around WooCommerce, this kind of development system really grows that bubble because it means that other people can interact with WooCommerce without the customer having to install a plugin for WordPress. Right? And funnily enough, that tiny little piece of the puzzle of having to install an extension is the most painful point for the customer. And that really, you know, it's, it seems like nothing to us. And you think, oh, okay, I'm going to install a plugin for WordPress. It's, it's normal. I've done it a thousand times. You know, I've got my WordPress SEO and whatever other plugins that I'm, I'm using. And I've done it. It's no problem. But then you get the guy who's running on GoDaddy or HostGator for $4.95 a month. And he has directory permissions issues. And he tries to install just WooCommerce from WordPress.org. He's not even clicking buttons. He just types WooCommerce and hits go. Right? He's not doing anything particularly difficult. And then it says, could not create directory. And then he sits at the screen and he goes, well, I don't, I don't really know what that means. But I'm going to act like I know what that means because now this is hurting my ego. So I'm going to try and Google it. And then somehow they find a knowledge base article in a Google group that doesn't actually explain what's going on. Before you know it, all they've tried to do is install a plugin. But they sit there and they go, well, that didn't work really well, did it? So now their confidence in the platform is shot. Their confidence in WordPress is shot. And they haven't got a website, which is the whole point of what they started doing in the first place. So eliminating that step and at the same time enabling people to build systems that don't rely on that step was a huge puzzle piece for us, just in growing WooCommerce and scaling up the whole ecosystem, not just the core platform itself. And on that point, it's important to be aware of that ecosystem as well. So the product is bigger than us. It's bigger than the box we ship it in, right? It's important to make sure that people can actually leverage the product and that can exist around the product. So they can say, well, I've built this system completely independent of WooThemes that does metrics or you know, whatever it might be. It's important to be aware of that ecosystem and to really encourage it and to foster it and grow it. You know, even if it's like agency business, it doesn't even have to be service business or, or product business. You know, people building an agency that works within WooCommerce is something we want to promote. And two such businesses that we do promote quite actively, these guys work with us quite a lot selling product as well. They do client work, so Skyverge and Prospress. So Prospress is the company that actually was built. These two businesses, just to digress for a moment, these two businesses were built because WooCommerce exists, not before WooCommerce exists. So Prospress was built by the guy who developed our WooCommerce subscriptions extension, which is our best-selling extension on WooThemes.com. And that just allows you to offer you know, subscription services of various types within WooCommerce. And that was hugely in demand. And we spoke to Brent and we said, you know, hey Brent, don't you want to come and sell that with us? And before you know it, he's built this business, he's hired a couple of people, they work on subscriptions all day, every day. They build other products as well, but that's their key focus. And the business I mean, it's not necessary. There's a high likelihood the business would not exist today if WooCommerce didn't exist. Skyverge is a similar story. So these two guys, Max and Justin, met completely online. They have separate agreements with us, building separate products for WooCommerce. And they liked each other's stuff, and they said, well, let's try and work together. So they collaborated on a couple of projects, and they said, well, this works. And they formed a new business. And they're easily one of the biggest businesses that works with us. So they have a slew of extensions. It must be probably in the 50s by now. And they build everything from payment gateways to core enhancements, you know, things like uh, enhanced product reviews or you name it, right? So they've built this business based on purely the existence of WooCommerce. They do client work as well, you know, building WooCommerce websites for agencies and things like that. And these guys didn't actually meet until probably almost a year of collaborating together. So it's kind of a small version of the Woo story as well, you know, because Mark Magnus and Eddie didn't meet for about 18 months after starting Woo Themes. So it's, it's just nice to, to see these businesses grow as a result of WooCommerce's existence. 
you know, hopefully many more. So tying back into the community for a minute, we spoke about commits earlier, and there's 11,185 commits as of 1st of March. So I also mentioned about three engineers working full-time or full-time on the product, and then now we sit with four guys working full-time still on the product. It doesn't happen on its own. So this is 327 contributors, so we, we treat everyone equally, right? So it's not about how much you wrote, it's about the fact that you contributed in the first place. So whether it's a class, or changing a readme file, or it doesn't really matter, as long as you contribute. You know, that's not to say that 326 people just changed the readme file, because that's definitely not the case. But it's important to recognize that there's 327 people that are looking at this project and have actually given back, and that's just really the power of open source. You know, that's helped us to scale so dramatically. Something like unit tests, for example, which is something we spoke of earlier, we don't know about unit tests. Like I said, we didn't, we didn't start in the beginning saying, we need unit tests before we come as ships. We just said, well, unit tests are nice. We've heard the words, um, kind of know what they are, but we've never set up the system before. And we had one of our contributors, Max from Skyverge, actually build our first unit test structure. So, you know, guys like that, they understand that giving back to the open project helps them to grow their business and to grow what they do. So I just kind of really felt I wanted to recognize that here for a minute as well. So we've spoken about scale, we've spoken about webhooks and APIs and, and how you build the ecosystem and things like that, but how do you do it internally? You know, you can't, you know, everyone, everyone who's written a line of code in their life knows that if you work on the same file every day, all day, you will get bored. It's just that simple. Developers get bored very quickly because it's not a challenge anymore. You need a challenge. You need something new. So what we've done here is we expand other product lines around our product. Right? This is how we ensure the longevity of WooCommerce going forward. So what that means for us is looking a bit into the past. You know, I've had a slide up here recently at times with the Back to the Future. You know, so Back to the Woocher is the, the sort of moniker that I went with there, but I, I left that out today. I wanted to be more serious. So we started as a theming business. Right? We built designs for WordPress, and that was what we did. And then 2011, we started building plugins. So for like four or five years, we were building themes. All day, every day, it was designs. That was it. And we discovered we needed to do something different, so we built the e-commerce platform. But in order to grow these other lines around WooCommerce, we needed to think about what we know best. And what we know best is theming. So we built Storefront, which is a free WordPress theme that complements WooCommerce. So this is the WooCommerce theme. It's the only WooCommerce theme you'll ever really need. Um, you know, if you haven't ever tried it before, go for it. If you've been hunting on Theme Forest for that perfect theme, just go to this one. It's free. WordPress.org slash themes slash storefront, I believe it is. We've just clocked over 100,000 downloads the other day, which is quite nice. It's promising growth for us as well, and it proves that the open source model really does work. So we really are proud of this. This, you know, going through theme after theme after theme, we, we hit the same snags every time. It was, my slider doesn't work in IE7, right? That was the biggest snag ever. And you get so tired of it, really, you do. So, you know, we looked at what people actually need, and half the people don't even use the slider. So we said, well, Storefront doesn't have a slider, done. All right, that's, we'll check that off the list. And over the years, you know, theming became so bloated that we decided we needed to go back to the very beginning. And like Mark mentioned, he started designing yesterday. When he started doing web design, he started with Kubrick, which was the default WordPress theme back in the day, and that was an interesting theme, to put it lightly. Um, but it was simple. It was really plain and simple. No funky functionality in there. No portfolios, no sliders, no shortcodes, none of that. It was just a design that worked really well. And that's what we wanted to achieve with Storefront. So that's where we're at now. You can customize Storefront totally using the Visual Customizer, you know, it's really easy for anyone to use, and you can build amazing child themes off of it. I saw one yesterday, in fact, that looked absolutely nothing like Storefront, and it looked incredible. It just, the guys really took the whole product to another level, just by thinking out the box just a little bit. And then, like I said, we, you know, we've done themes, we've done WooCommerce, we've gone back and done themes again, and, you know, how do you, how do you keep doing this? sort of thing all the time, you know, in five years' time, we're going to have to do something again. You know, we'll keep having to grow and grow and grow and grow, and how do you do this? And it's simply just repeating the formula over and over, like learning 
what worked and what didn't. So, for example, for the next product we write from scratch, we will build unit tests from the beginning because we now know what we need to do there. We'll look at the functionality of the product and say, does this really need all of these features? You know, can we get by with the first five and see how it goes? You know, things like that. And just keep repeating the formula and refining it over and over again. So like I've said, you know, cook your favorite dish often because every time you cook it, it'll get better. And that's me. Thanks, guys. Questions? Okay, people have stopped being shy. <laughs> Come on, guys, you're big boys and ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. Hi. Um, what was your doing your unit test? So, going from not doing any unit test to doing unit tests, what was the biggest hurdle that you, you had to overcome to get to unit tested code? To, to get to a point where we needed the unit test or to get the unit tests up and running? To get it up and running. It's just setting up the infrastructure. Just really, it was about understanding. I mean, we, you can spend a million years picking the platform. But for us, it, we chose Travis straight in the beginning. And because we're an open source project, we can use Travis for free. So it was really easy to set up. There's no payment barriers or anything like that. I mean, that's really a barrier because it's providing so much value anyway. But just in terms of setup time, there was none of that. It was really just about understanding how sort of the YAML files and things like that are actually structured. And then that, that was really it's just the knowledge. This knowledge barrier was it, really. There's one back here. Yes, hi. Um, I was wondering, you say you, you're developing for the ecosystem, uh, basically for your developers and so on. Um, how do you ensure that what you're developing actually provides a good I want to say user experience for those developers, whether it's APIs or, or plug-in SDKs and so on. Um, okay, so just to clarify what I meant there just as well by the develop the ecosystem thing, it's about developing the engine, not necessarily what is actually built with the engine, basically. So what we did there is we actually built one or two things with the API to say, well, you know, what would I need if I was building a tool that used the API? And we actually went and built a few small prototypes and said, well, this is what we need. So we'll put it in there. But a large thing that we have, we, so we do a lot of lean development, so agile product development. And that basically is release early and release often. Right, so we released the initial API with just push. Yes, just push. No, is it? So many different terms. It was either just push or just pull. I can never remember which. But it was with like one thing. Right, and we put it out there, and people said, oh, it would be really great if I could push stuff. And that's what it was. We just did pull. And then we, we did push. And we did update and put and delete and all of that. But just going through it slowly, you know, for example, I had a conversation yesterday with someone who said, I really like your API, but just one way of handling inventory management could be slightly different for my particular use case, and I feel like it could benefit other people as well. You know, so just having those conversations is really what it's about. You know, put something out there and then just talk to people and say, well, give them a means to give you feedback. You know, that, was, that was a key factor for us. Hello, um, your unit test. Yes. Um, do you use it for functional testing, like integration testing and seeing whether one part of the system breaks the other part? Or is it just true unit tests with mocks and testing the behavior? At this point, you know, we've, we cover about 20% of WooCommerce, if I'm not correct there. I, I stand very corrected on that exact percentage. But, I mean, we're covering a very small percentage of unit, with unit tests. So it's very early days for us. Right now, it's does this method do what it needs to do? Um, you know, and things like that. Can it do this at scale? And, like I say, at this point, we're focusing on, on writing unit tests for each particular area of WooCommerce to make sure that that piece does what it does really well. And then over time, we'll grow that to say, okay, how does this work within the grand ecosystem of WooCommerce as well? Uh, 
since your uh, platform is WordPress, what challenges do you meet uh, when you face updates on WordPress that you make sure that it doesn't break the uh, WooCommerce or your themes? So what challenges do we face in terms of WordPress updating? And the security updates okay. also? So we are very, very, very conscious of all WordPress related updates. We follow absolutely everything we need to there just to keep on top of everything. You know, we've got guys working on WooCommerce all the time, literally around the clock now. So all different time zones. And when WordPress updates something, we're very, very conscious of it. So something like a small update, for example, the uh, UI update in 3.8 of WordPress is a completely new interface. We needed to adjust WooCommerce to make sure that it worked with that update. So we'd actually been running, you know, we have, what we do is basically just to digress for a moment. So WordPress.org holds the master copy of WooCommerce, the official releases, and then GitHub holds the bleeding edge copy. So we actually had a bleeding edge copy of WooCommerce running with full WordPress 3.8 compatibility before the first beta version of WordPress 3.8 was released. You know, so we always run the development version, keep on top of that. Um, where it came in very handy was there was a WordPress database. They, they have a WordPress database abstraction class. And we had to make an update there to how we were running queries because they said, if you do it this way, it's insecure. And if you do it the way we recommend, it's more secure. So we actually had to go in and update that quite quickly. And we were able to do that because we keep on top of it. So it's just really about being aware of the platform that we work with. Um, I, I'm just, can you clarify exactly what you mean by, you, you mentioned unit tests for scale. You, are you talking about, uh, you're not talking about usage scale, you're more talking about deployment scale, I'm assuming. Um, in, yeah, it's, I don't know exactly which one it would fit into, but just to clarify, so what we talk about is, can the system actually handle hundreds of thousands of orders? You know, a good example of this is the reporting tool within WooCommerce, for example. So that's got to do reporting on orders, customer data, products sold, etc. It's a big query, returning lots of information. So does our system actually cater for that? Okay, so you, you're using unit tests as well for performance testing? Yes. Okay. 